depth of being able to accept that money. And I told him I'd jump on that advocacy bandwagon in a minute uh, because I've seen the result of what a program like this can produce. It really literally is life changing for our students. And we just love what we do here at UI Reach. Um, I have put my name and contact in the chat in case any of you wanna reach out afterwards um, to get some more information about what we do. Our website is just loaded with lots of information about the program. So feel free to browse that. If any of you are ever so inclined, we do virtual tours now because of the pandemic. We do virtual tours on a regular basis and we invite professionals, educators, influencers, along with students and parents to join those tours, okay? So I'll launch in here. I'll start with the presentation. You are Reach got started back in 2008. Um, can you see my screen? Okay, great. Um, so we got started back in 2008. Um, at the time, the Lieutenant Governor, um, uh, who was in office had a son or still has a son that has uh, learning and intellectual disabilities. And she wanted to find a program for him because she'd heard about this model taking off in other states. And there wasn't one in Iowa. Well, she got to work. She started her own advocacy right here at the university. She started her own advocacy at the state house. And within two years, our program was born. Uh, we started with about 20 students in that very first year. So our program was born as of the advocacy of uh, then Lieutenant Governor Sally Peterson. So um, our office suite is named after her because without her, we probably would not exist. So we've been in existence now since 2010, and um, you'll learn a little bit more about us as we go through the presentation. We just revised our vision statement and our mission statement, and we have a new um, tagline or marketing statement as we like to call it. Um, it says your future is within, is within reach. That's our tagline because we believe that what we do is future changing for our students, for the ones that come through our program. Um, and they, they embrace a brand new future after they've, after they've completed the program. So we're really proud of what happens there. Our vision, we really wanna see people with disabilities self-directed uh, and included and the biggest part of that is we want the communities to change. We want the communities to be more accepting of people with all abilities. And in this time where diversity uh, initiatives are all over the place, we feel like we fit right in that spectrum. We want, the we want to have impact so that communities see abilities and not disabilities, that they see the person first, that they see what they can bring to their communities, their, their places of work, their places of worship, wherever, they have something to offer, all of us. And so we want that to be our the, the impact of UI, UI Reach being here. And then our mission, we just cultivate supports and opportunities. That's really what we're about, right? How do we create, uh, we're, not, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna change anybody's life, but we can help create those environments in which they can have a life-changing experience. So that's, that's really uh, what we're about and that, uh, success in everyday life is so important. One of our students actually contributed that line to us because uh, we had a more fancy way of saying it. But they said, hey, we want to be successful, not just while we're in at, you at reach, you are reach or while we're at work, but we want to be successful across every spectrum. So we, we're thankful that that he brought that to our attention and we added it to our, our mission statement. Program philosophy, you've heard all of these terms before, right? person-centered, uh, strengths-based, positive environments, self-determination. And we um, believe that that's the way to go because, you know, it is, we, we say all the time, our students are in the driver's seat. It's their life and they should be making the major choices regarding what their life will be like. Um, so we do have that focus. Uh, we do have a person-centered planning process where we sit with every single student and, and talk about what would you like to achieve while you're here at the University of Iowa? There are some things that you must achieve, like go to class and all that good stuff, but what else would you like to achieve while you're here? So we, we in, in embrace that whole person-centered, strength-based, positive environment. And what we try to craft is a, a customized experience for every single stakeholder. Our stakeholders are not just our students. Our stakeholders are their parents. Our stakeholders are our staff. 
Our stakeholders are all of those internship sites that host our students, other professors that teach classes that our students are in. All of those are our stakeholders. And we want to have impact on them in some kind of way. Uh, uh, our purpose is to impact them and, again, create those communities where our folk are accepted and valued. Um, in terms of an overview, we are what's called a CTP, a Comprehensive Transition Program. We get that designation from the Department of Education um, that describes program like ours, which means there's a huge focus on transition, but uh, transition occurs in many areas of that student's life. So we are a CTP. Um, we offer a general certificate and we offer some enhanced credentials while students are here. Students attend up to four years and um, they, they can earn non-transferable credits. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means in just a moment. Uh, we're currently at 41 students. We had about 10 students who took a gap year because of the pandemic. They decided that you know it was a little bit safer for them to be at home this year. Um, but I had the, uh, the, the very joyous occasion of touching base with all of them and their parents just a few weeks ago. And the question was, how soon can we get back? You know, we, we're ready, especially the parents. Yes, you can have them back. Um, <laughs> we're ready for them to return and uh, enjoy their voyage uh, at UI Reach. So for the fall 2021, we'll be at a record high of 65 students enrolled in the program uh, come uh, August of this year. Our incoming class will be somewhere between 20 and 25 students, and that class is almost full, believe it or not. We think we only have about four seats left uh, for that incoming class. So our recruitment efforts are going uh, very well for this year. UI Reach focuses on three basic areas. Academics, you're going to college, right? You're gonna go to class, you're gonna learn. Uh, we focus a lot though on campus life and independent living. This is where students get that first experience of, um, yeah, without mom and dad present, I'm living in a situation where I'm making major decisions and I'm around people that are my own age and learning the rules of engagement on a campus. So we call the campus a life portion our biggest classroom. And then there's a strong, strong emphasis on career development and transition. How do we move you toward that all important goal of getting uh employed once you once you leave us. Uh, in the academic arena, our students can take, we have a core group of classes that UI REACH teaches, but our students can also take traditional classes, any class in the general catalog for which they meet the prerequisites. So many, many of our students uh, take classes and they can take those for credit or they can audit that class. OK, so we have had, I think, about four students to date who have graduated from our program and then moved on to a fully degreed program at here at the University of Iowa or at other schools. So that academic enrichment piece is huge. Um, our students do learn uh, great note taking skills, uh, the, the, the executive functioning skills of planning so I can be at class on time when mom and dad won't be there to wake me up for class any longer. Plan so you can go get breakfast and be at class on time and then plan some time to, for your studies as well. Um, I will talk a little bit about our, uh, a little bit more about our, our campus life piece. Again, our biggest classroom. On campus here at the University of Iowa, there are some, this says 450, but there are actually now about 500 plus student organizations where students of various interests and interest groups uh, congregate uh, to, to socialize and to just have some fun and uh, perhaps do some other interesting on campus or off campus events, community service and the like. So um, we often say to our students, if you have an interest, there's a student org for that. So there's a strong emphasis on getting our students to reach beyond just their cohort here at UI Reach and become very involved to the degree that they desire in campus life. Uh, we say at UI Reach that we are kind of like that little pink spoon at Baskin Robbins. So our job is to help students sample so they can, from that, make informed choices. Right. If all you've been offered all your life was vanilla, chocolate and strawberry, you don't know about Rocky Road or Heavenly Hash or Oreo, you know, Oreo cookie ice cream. Right. So we give students a variety of experiences from which they can make good choices moving forward. Uh, we don't make those choices for them. We just, again, 
cultivate those opportunities and supports that students can get to experiment and experience. So there's tons of stuff across campus that students can be involved in. Uh, in the residence halls, we are not segregated to one floor or one building. We're spread out across the residence halls on campus. And our students have a UI Reach roommate, but they're living right next door to traditional students. Again, pushing that maximum integration, but beyond integration, that inclusion. Uh, encouraging students to go to those hall meetings that are held in their residence halls every single week to get to know other residents of their of their hall and to just learn how to access all the benefits that the campus affords. Uh, a mainstay in our programming is the intensive career instruction piece. So in year one, students come, they have lots of classes about uh, workplace readiness, uh, about uh, setting re realistic goals, about just introduction to different career options. That's all in year one. By year two, they start going out and doing an internship. That internship is typically six to nine hours per week per student, and they have that internship for a full semester. Uh, they can repeat that same site in the following semester, or they can try something different. Again, that little pink spoon. You want to try as much as you can so that you can say, I really like this, not so much on that one. Okay, so the internship experience is huge. Has the community embraced that? Has, has campus partner uh, embraced that? Absolutely. Our campus partners and the Iowa City community has rallied to the cause so much so till we have more internship sites than we have students every year. So they are very welcoming. We have had to do a little bit of work with them to say this is not just a feel good opportunity for you. What we want the students to walk away with is a new skill. What we want them to walk away with is uh, very candid feedback about their performance, because when they get in a paid job situation, that's what's going to count. Your ability to have the skills that you need and accept feedback and develop those interpersonal skills that are all important in the workplace. So our students go to these internships, our staff visit them on you know a rotating basis, maybe once or twice uh, a week. We have no 100% job coaching uh, by our staff at these sites. They are naturally supported by the sites themselves. Our staff just drop in to do observations uh, and they uh, give feedback to the student and to the site, but our students rise to that challenge. They are able to um, uh, uh, integrate into those sites and do well at those sites without our staff being there for much of the time. Again, it's on basically a drop-in, a drop-in basis. So of the of the things that parents say they want their students to walk away with from our program it's that employability that's one of the top ones the next one guess what it is it's social right how do you mix and mingle how do you make friends how do you interact with people right um, so those are the two big things that parents say are the transformative um, skills that they want students to have uh, when they leave us uh, when a student is ready to graduate, and we have a convocation exercise every year, and it's wow, it's an amazing experience. Um, parents are crying, students are crying, instructors are crying, everybody's crying, but they're crying because, uh, you know, when that student may have entered that program, uh, people had told them all their lives what they couldn't accomplish. And now they're able to say, I finished a college program. Pretty amazing for a person with a disability to now have those kinds of, of uh, bragging rights. Um, more than that, the parents and the students say, I now have a tribe. I have a group of people that I went through school with that I can refer back to, that I can keep uh, relationships built with a long time. Uh, so that graduation, that convocation day is a huge experience for everybody that participates in it. Uh, but after a student graduates from UI Reach, uh, or before they graduate, we do some heavy transition planning from them. What did you learn while you were here? And how will that apply in the environment that you're transitioning to, whether that be to your hometown or whether you're going to some someplace different? And I'll talk about some of those some places different that students go in just a moment. But heavy emphasis on how do you take what you learned here and apply it outside of this college environment? Uh, we do 
keep in touch with our graduates on a, on a regular basis. We have added a position, in fact, called a, a alumni support specialist that keeps in touch with them. And we're now able to offer even some continuing education types of activities to our alumni because the program has evolved over the course of the years. And we have some brand new things that we are offering to students that weren't in place when our alumni came through. But with that new position, we're able to make those offerings available uh, to our alumni. We do a lot of social events as well. Uh, we go to, uh, to Des Moines to do some, um, some of the baseball games there. We've gone to Chicago. We've gone to, actually we've gone all the way out to the West Coast for some of those reconnect events. A great time for students and families to reconnect um, and join themselves. We had one student um, whose family used to do a tailgate at every single home game for UI Reach. And we invited alumni and current students to be a part. So, you know, we're, we're maintaining that family atmosphere um, that's um, developed while they are here. Um, Mandy told me that you, you guys were specifically interested in what kinds of supports is it taking to get students to, to that two to four years? A lot. Um, it's taking quite a bit to help students navigate the differences in not being in mom and dad's house anymore, not being in high school anymore, having a lot of flexibility on campus when you come. Uh, you're not going to be in class from 8.30 to 3.30 every day your class schedule might be a whole lot different. And there's nobody's gonna pick you up and take you to where you need to go every day. You're gonna have to learn how to, how to navigate the campus. It takes a tremendous amount of supports to do that. So all of our staff um, have a role for advising. They meet with each student on a weekly basis to just say, how's it going? Getting along okay with your roommate? You're finding what you need on campus? Uh, how's it going with your classes? Where do you need help? And so those advisors meet with those students at least once a week, and they provide support to them on an ongoing basis. We hire probably about 15 traditional students to work as mentors to the UI Read students. And so there's a very different dynamic between a student and advisor or student and instructor and student and mentor. Very much closer to their age group, a lot of better rapport there. Um, and they're going through some of the same experiences. So we found that tremendously effective, hiring those other students who are in college who have a desire to work with our students. Uh, we also have um, interns. This, this year we had two full-time uh, therapeutic rec interns. They work for us 40 hours a week. We had three social work interns who each gave us uh, 10 hours a week. And so we're um, by virtue of us being in the College of Education here at the University of Iowa, we are definitely a part of grooming that next generation to continue this line of work. So we're really big on internships um, and involving traditional students in learning uh, what we do and how we do it. Uh, we have in the residence halls, uh, we do have uh, specific UI Reach resident assistants that support the students during the after hours. Um, but the traditional resident assistants see the value in our program and they provide support as well. It's just that the ones that we hire have a specific responsibility for UI REACH students. And then the traditional resident assistants have responsibility to all students in that, in that uh, residence hall. Oh, we just hired a full-time social worker last year because we see, you know, our students are coming to us with mental health needs with um, uh, other needs that the community can help to address, uh, counseling needs, therapy needs, you name it. You all are very familiar with this. Those, those issues don't go away magically when a student comes to college, but we have to figure out how to deliver uh, those additional support needs in the appropriate environments while they're here. So we hired the social worker to do, just do that, connect us to community resources. One of our staff is always on call. Um, one of the things that our students have to be able to do is manage free time and negotiate safety while they're on campus. Uh, but there's lots of free time in their schedule after classes, especially evenings and weekends. But one of our staff is always available in the event that one of our students need us. And they just call the online um, uh, number uh, to access that support. Uh, I mentioned our alumni support specialist. Uh, he's doing a phenomenal job of reaching out to those alumni. When we used to reach out for alumni data in the past, it was always 
a heavy lift to try to get just 20% of them to respond back to the surveys that we sent out. We instituted a new progress, a proof process with our alumni support specialist, where he makes an individual touch with all of our alumni on a more of a casual basis. And while they're talking, he's gathering that alumni data, right? So we've gone from getting maybe 20% response from alumni back to getting 94% responses from our alumni back. It's all in that personal touch. And he knows many of them because he's been here pretty much almost the entire time the program has uh, been in place. So when, when I talk about alumni data in just a few minutes, realize that that's based on 94% response rate from our students, all right? So we're, we're extremely proud of that. And then wherever possible, we plug students into generic campus supports. There's tons of supports. Not only is it taking more for UI REACH students to get through those four years, but national studies are revealing that it's taking college students in general an immense amount of support to get through the time that they spend in college. Uh, some of those reports point back to things like Facebook and social media as introducing new complexities on students' ability to, to manage situations. And the jury's still out on that one, but we can say we can see where it has had some impact on some of our students. Uh, Mandy also asked me to focus on how are people paying for this? Right, so our in-state tuition is about, including room and board is about 30,000 a year. And our out-of-state tuition is close to 50,000 a year. So how are people paying for this? Um, one, they're managing, they're figuring it out. They're figuring out how to do that. But here are some of the resources that we help students tap into by virtue of the fact that we are a comprehensive transition program as designated by the Department of Education. Students do, uh, qualify for Pell Grants based on financial need. Um, the FE, FSEOG money and the work study, all of that a student submits, many of you are familiar with the FAFSA form. They submit that form and by virtue of submitting that form, they can become eligible for those first three bullets that are up there. Uh, we have done a great job of reaching out to various communities and encouraging families to do so uh, for private scholarships to or agencies like United Way, Kiowa, uh, Kiwanas, you name it. Uh, we've been encouraging folk to reach out to get those scholarships to offset their costs for coming to REACH. Uh, UR REACH itself has awarded over $2, mil $2 million in scholarship funds since we got started. So we have some great fundraisers who go out there and get those funds for us. And we're able to help those students offset that cost. VR funds some of our classes. And uh, we've had at least one state and we're looking for more. Perhaps West Virginia can be that state. We're looking for more wherein there's flexibility and use of the waiver dollars to be able to offset the cost of tuition. It will offset room and board, but perhaps it can offset the cost of tuition. And you'll see why this is a, a reasonable investment in just a minute when we talk about our stats uh, for, our, our, for our outcomes. Uh, an initial investment in two to four years can have huge return in the years after that student graduates from our program, okay? Uh, we accept uh, 529 plans, of course, and then <clears throat> the vast majority of the financing, parents figure out ways to finance that. Our students are not eligible for student loans because we don't confer a degree, uh, but parents figure out, become very creative in ways to figure out how to make that financing work, all right? Um, here we go. Outcomes data. Again, this is a, a, a shot of one of our graduating classes having some fun after the graduating graduation ceremony. But here we go. We have today, as of now, about 185 graduates uh, from the UI REACH program. 89% employed within the first year, right? 89%. We think that's largely due to the heavy emphasis on the internship and perhaps some paid internship experiences while they are with us, they get that experience before they ever leave us. So it translates into something they can put on their resume as experience. And um, we believe that that's a heavy influencer in, the, in that. 100% of our employed alumni earn more than minimum wage. We don't have anybody earning minimum wage or less. Certainly not any, um, uh, C, C, what is it? I forgot what it's called. That sub minimum wage allowance that allows people to work in settings where they can earn less than minimum wage. 100% um, 
earn minimum wage. It's on the next slide, but I'll go ahead and mention it now. This is 100% community integrated employment, right? So this is all in the community and most of them continue to work with minimal supports from a job coach. They continue to utilize natural supports in those environments. What are the top industries in which our students are finding work? They're listed there. One of the big ones we're, we're investigating now, all of you have probably heard lots of language about there's a DSP shortage, direct support professional shortage in our industry. <clears throat> Some of our students could, could be a companion to a person who has a disability. So why not hire them? They come with a perspective that other hirees won't have. So we're looking into figuring out how can we help some of our students get DSP certified so that they can help address the shortage that's in that field now. Certainly the same thing is true in elder care. How can they become do companion services um, in, in elder care? Again, 100% competitive integrated employment. 51% of our alumni live independently. That is, they don't live with mom or dad anymore, right? So um, think about for a moment what Medicaid is spending every year on uh, supported employment, day programs, and residential habilitation. And think about that 50 grand that I talked about just a moment ago. So if a person can spend, say, two or three years with us, at a price tag of 150,000, but they come off and they, they're working in integrated settings. They don't live in a, in a necessarily in a group home or anything, but they're living on their own and their social network is expanded. I think that's a pretty doggone good return on investment. So that's the advocacy for us with Medicaid and other places. Let's figure out how we can use that upfront investment to further invest in the future of these persons who will become taxpayers and who will become contributors in their communities. A significant number of our graduates relocate to Iowa City. Iowa City is not the only place though. Uh, we've had one group who uh, one of the guys came from Colorado and he convinced two of his roommate, college roommates to move out to Colorado with him, right? So uh, they're branching out and they're moving out on their own and doing some really exciting stuff. Okay, that's it. I made it exactly 30 minutes. I made it, right? I, I got the stopwatch to prove it. There it is. So I did it. Um, so here we go. I'm going to open it up now to see if anyone has any questions about anything um, that I presented here today. That was, that was a lot of information, Bill. And I just want to say, I wrote down the first thing you said. I was like, I want to keep that comment because you said we're looking to change communities. And, and that, that really just resonated and I wanted to bring us back to that statement. Yeah, and that's a, that's a big task, right? Uh, fortunately, Mandy, we're in a generation now, the younger folk, they have grown up with persons with disabilities in their classrooms, in the mainstream. So it's becoming a little bit easier, but there's still a lot of work. There's still a lot of work to be done there. Absolutely. Does anyone have any particular questions for Bill? Anyone want a virtual tour? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Glenda, way to go. More than one of your clients has as a DSP. Absolutely amazing. And we may be touching base with you to say, tell us how you made that happen. Did they go through the DSP certification through NADSP or are they just trained on the job? On the job. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. They went with job coaches and had their whole thing. Um, we work with them through DRS and I, I'm a DRS job development specialist. And so we worked with them to get them hired on our waiver side. Awesome. So yeah, they work with our waiver clients and like everywhere else I've ever seen a client of ours through DRS, they're the hardest working people. You got it. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and they, and they have that inside track on what it means to have a disability, right? So some of those yeah. insensitivities that the rest of us might have, they, they, they're they in tune with that, right? So yeah, yeah I'll, I'll be reaching out to you to talk more about that. <laughs> All and right. we, have, we have a question in chat, but I want to mention before I go to this question, Bill, that there's a group, and you may know of RCM out of Washington. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they've got an internal DSP training program that um, Amy Shaw Brooks 
um, developed. And so they're, they're churning people through that. They're churning their clients through that DSP training. And I think that they're going to, I think there'll be a model for the country one of these days. I don't know if, if awesome. got wind of it yet. But awesome. RCM. Yeah. Check them yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. I know Amy, in fact. Oh, I you can, do? This is the V8 moment. Why didn't you call him? She's also a part of Anchor. And, Amy um, is a fantastic advocate. Maybe I can get yeah. one of these months. I know we have a full schedule, but now that I'm thinking about it, we probably need to hear from Amy. Yeah, yeah, she's she's great. Absolutely great. Yeah, and, so services built through Medicaid. Many of the states have um, self-directed funds where perhaps as a trade-off for um, not getting the full gamut of services, they have some money that they can direct in ways that they choose. And that's the way we parlay those into uh, offset tuition uh, in the one state. That one state is Minnesota. Um, and that student got to take their money, their $25,000 and apply it to tuition um, uh, um, as, a, as a result of that um, self-directed service um, uh, component. Um, and and we're, we're fully, fully confident that that student would um, again, end up needing fewer waiver services in the long run because of the skills that they'll pick up while they're here. So is that that client's full waiver fund for the year or just a portion of it? He actually, uh, we had to split it up into two uh, semesters. Um, but yes, that is his allotment for the year. And then next, since it covered most of his tuition, his parents were fine with that, right? And so next year, he'll come up for his next allotment. Okay. It's clever. Yeah. Very clever. Good. Any other questions? I think we're going to need to explore that waiver. It doesn't sound like it's a very common conversation that's happening yet, but what a great utilization of your waiver units. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, hey, if you guys don't have any additional questions, you have my name and my contact mm -hmm. in the chat box. Um, Glenda, I got to get your name and your contact so we can talk some more. And yeah, I can link you guys Amy up. As well. mm -hmm. That'd be great. Um, yeah. But thanks for allowing me to come today and talk a little bit about our program. Mm -hmm. uh, again, welcome you to take one of those virtual tours and be with us in that way and learn even more detail on how we do what we do. That's but great. Thank you for, for that invitation. Me. And Bill, feel free to stay and do our small focus groups. But if you got to get back to business, we will understand. We've got your contact information. All right. I, I really do have to bow out. We've got a parent town hall meeting and a student council meeting this evening. They're going to want to hear That's from you. Busy night. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Take care, everybody. Much appreciated. Bye-bye. All right. Yes, all of the people that we, Joel, all the people that we're dealing with are between 18 and 25 years old. Good. Thank you. Got all right. that one. All right. Appreciate that. All right. Thanks, Bill. Okay. So I think that was really useful. I think we got some strategies that we're going to hear in our small groups. Um, so what we are going to do next is um, I think I have us set up to go into small groups. And I just want to do a couple of things before we do that. I want to review our small groups from last month. And then we'll know, um, like right now, we've got 43 minutes left until our end time at five o'clock. So we'll just split whatever time we have that you'll spend that half of that time in your small group answering some questions. And then half of that time, we'll come back into the large group. And we'll have seven people in each group. Uh, so we'll still be able to introduce ourselves and do a quick quick round robin in our small groups. And I did see some people drop their information in the chat and that's great too. We always want to know who we're talking to, who's at the table. So really quickly, I'm just going to show you the conversations we had last month, because I think some neat stuff came out of those conversations. And I said really quickly, but it snuck away from me there. Summaries. OK, here we go. All right, so here are the, some of the things I just wanted to highlight from last month. And when we finish our transition to higher education series, which next month will be our last topic for that, I'll put all this stuff together. Can you make that bigger? Sorry for interrupting. But yeah, I need sure. To... Mm. Sorry, thanks. Just a quick <laughs> highlight. No, I appreciate that. Mm. Yeah, I can't see it. It's not very useful. All right, so I just mentioned some of the champions that were in our conversations of 
the things that were working well across the state. And we heard people mentioned like Bridge Valley, West Virginia Division of Rehab Services, Toyota, and I think that was through a partnership with Bridge Valley, uh, Fairmont State, Pierpont, WVU Medicine, and WVU Parkersburg. So just to highlight our champions, these were um, when we were talking about things that were working right, programs that were utilizing conversations that are happening as it relates to employers and employees linking up uh, post uh, higher education. Some of the needs that were identified were orientation to campus life, and we heard that from Bill just now, open-mindedness from employers. Uh, sometimes they're just unsure, so letting them know what supports are out there can be that that jump over that hurdle. And then lack of supports as um, young people become of age and they don't have, you know, maybe in third grade, they've got more people looking after what their activities are than when they're 19. So they just lack that support. Fear of failure, uh, they need peer support groups. And we also need to reach some of those niche populations like the couch surfers that aren't necessarily homeless but are at risk and our juvenile justice youth. So some of the gaps. And what do we think is working as far as outreach? We think lunch and learns are really great to bring people together, uh, taking college visits in high school or virtual tours like Bill mentioned, uh, introducing more college preparatory courses, having disability centers set up, and matching clients with necessary supports through assessments and um, information and referral. Having a single point person, that made me think of our lovely business services teams across the state at Workforce, and I see Tracy. Uh, I know we have some others from the business work um, services teams that have joined our conversations last month, and hopefully we'll see them in the future. And we need to let schools know about subsidy programs. What are they facing once they get out of school? We've got this nice safe little classroom and what's next? Some past programs, I had mentioned a financial um, aid conglomerate. It was through um, CFWV the, um, and the treasury department. They had things like the FAFSA bus that came around. Um, it was big in Charleston and the funding went away for that, but it was really a nice thing. Um, we also considered some past programs that we really miss is uh, DRS's ability to pay for more expansive degrees and for transportation, including the driver's training. So those are maybe things that we're missing that we had access to before. What are we doing that's working to increase rates? What can employers do? They can talk to schools, be part of the conversation. They can offer paid internships, trial work, um, include people with disabilities in their employer relations. And then what did we take away from our presentation? Some of the um, main ideas from Dr. Griggle's conversation were to get uh, country roads here in West Virginia uh, approved as a certificate program um, to focus on paid work because we learned that uh, paid work experience leads to paid work. It's like perpetual motion. And we just need to start more programs and get more long-term supports um, put in there. And don't just plug and uh, place and, and pl I think they say place and pray. Uh, and you just dump, dump a person off at a work experience and don't check on them later. Um, we should all know that, that that's not a great way to do things. And Dr. Griggle reinforced that through her conversations. So that was the wrap up on our conversation. Those were the kind of answers we came up with. And if you weren't with us next last month, that's what we're going to do next is to break into these small groups and you have um, a new set of questions to respond to. So I've got us set up into rooms and um, let's see, who do I have? I'm going to drop in the chat two files and Jen Tenney, if you could grab one of those files for your group and Gina Desmond, if I could call on you to grab the file for the other group, because uh, we are we're down a staff person today. So Gina, if you don't mind, I'm gonna put you on the spot. No problem. Stephanie with us calls that being thrown under the bus. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna take, so if you guys remember, we broke into three different perspectives. We wanna talk about the agency perspective, the employee perspective and the employer perspective. So Jen, your agency, right? Okay, so I dropped that file in there for you to answer questions. I think I sent it right to you. I didn't mean to, but I did. And um, Gina, if you could be our employee perspective professional, I've dropped that file in there. And we're gonna spend 15 minutes in these small groups. And it looks like those files sent to 
captain. And we have some team captains that helped us last month. And again, those people are going to change. But I see some people that were here last month that were timekeepers and recorders. I'm going to keep uh, Glenda in the room with me. She's going to be my team captain for the uh, employer focused. Gina is going to be our employee focused group. Jen's going to be our agency focused group. And I'm going to open these rooms. And if you got to go, you got to go. We'll see you next month. Open all rooms. You should get a notification. You can go to that room. Some of you will stay here with me. Random room assignments. I see you moving. Who do I get? Oh, all right. I think this is our group. Oh. That's all right, Elizabeth Diaz. You go ahead. We'll see you next month. Okay. Jump into the other rooms real quick. If you guys want to take a moment to go around the room and say who you are, where you are in the state, and what was your first job? So lightning round, my name is Mandy. I'm in Morgantown and my first job was at Hershey Park. And I'll be right back. Uh, Tracy, you go ahead next. You're next on my screen. My name is Tracy Kennedy. Them. All right, you guys are in here. And we can we are in here. introduce yourself, where you are in the state and what was your first job? So my name's Mandy. I'm in Morgantown and my first job was at Hershey Park. Jen, I'll pass it to you. My name is Jennifer Tenney. I'm also in Morgantown, and my first job. Hey, Gina, thanks hey. for doing that. No um, so you, got, you have Jason. I know we had a couple people had to leave in the transition there. Yeah, I know that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> we got Jason and Maggie. So. Okay, good. And, and so you, you want us back just before quarter two, or will it automatically just close? Um, out? Yeah, I'll close the rooms. Okay. Uh, we have small groups. We should get through the questions pretty quick. Okay. And um, you can start by introducing yourselves. And okay. in the other rooms, I have everyone saying who they are, uh, where they are in the state, and what was their first job. And so my name's oh. Lee, and I'm in Oregon Town, and my first job was at Hershey Park. Okay. All right. So I'm Gina Desmond, and I'm with Disability Rights of West Virginia. And my first um, paid job, I guess I'll say, was at TNL Hot Dogs at the mall there in Clarksburg. So that was yeah. pretty a pretty typical entry level job there. Yep, yep. And I, are Jason, are you guys there? I'm here. And then Jason's oh, there. Cool. And if you guys, if you guys want to come back into the main session, and, and uh, I know we've got smaller groups right now, so <laughs> for your questions, you come on back out to us. Um, um my first job. I'm with SME Resources. I'm the director of rehab services. My first job was holding a sign at Domino's. Nice. Nope. Did you guys get to introduce yourselves? Good. And I know some of you. Mm -hmm. So here we are. We've got some questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Was someone talking? We missed a couple of people, I think. Hey, man. Oh. Yeah, it's Danielle. I hadn't went yet. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. Keep going. Hi. So I'm Danielle. I'm with HRDF. Um, I'm actually somebody that probably blows up Doug's um, email regularly. Um, but my first job was working at Burger King. I love hearing about entry level jobs. And everyone started somewhere, right? Anyone else need to go yet? All right. So we're going to get started with our focus questions. Um, some of you were here last month, so you're familiar with what we're trying to do here, but we're trying to get to uh, just kind of the meat of some of the issues and things that we want to improve upon or things that we want to celebrate that are already working uh, really well. And so we're going to answer some questions from the perspective of the employer. So we're gonna to try to put ourselves in the employer's shoes and look at, which this is kind of the trickiest topic uh, being transitioned to higher education because sometimes those uh, conversation, that Venn diagram doesn't always meet in the middle. So uh, I think that we have the trickiest questions of the three groups, but I believe in you all. So let's see if I can share my screen here with our questions. 
Okay. And Gwen is our team captain. She helped me out last month. And so we're going to try to keep at least one person in each group each month uh, that has been in the group before and can kind of help lead things and keep us keep us on track. And of course, we never have our full um, time. So the timekeeper part has not really come into play yet because we're always crunched because there's just a lot to talk about. So let's look at these questions and our focus topic for this month is going to be financing the decision. So last month we really talked about kind of programs and policies and this month we want to focus in on the financial aid aspect and that's why I asked Bill to tell us uh, how the kids are paying to come to the REACH program because it's neat to offer these programs and to encourage uh, a college pathway, but we need to offer some solutions and some pathways for financing those choices. So do you think it's common for employers to offer incentive programs for employees to pay down student debt? And what about to continue their education and advance on the job? So continuing education that allows them to further their career. Think about the current state of affairs in West Virginia. Do you know of any incentive programs to help pay down student debt? I know. I'm that. aware of. Doug, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so that's, um, and I know there's one for um, if you work in a social service agency. Um, is anyone familiar with that program? I only know because I, when I worked at HRDF, some of my employees were, were using it. Tracy, do you know about it? Yes. So, so if you work for a, um, a government agency or a nonprofit, there is a program that you can enroll in when you have student loans. Um, there are some requirements. So you have to be in good standing. You have to make so many consecutive on-time payments. Um, you know, you have to verify employment and report that every so often, but there is a legitimate true program out there for those of us who do work for nonprofits, higher ed, service organizations, nonprofits, um, to be able to get some of our debt, some of our student debt forgiven. And so it forgives a portion of it if you meet the requirements. Okay. Correct. Yes. Good. And so if we if we could start harnessing that and mm -hmm. shouting about it, uh, imagine how many because, you know, I just know, I mean, of, of maybe four employees, I would have maybe two um, submit that form to me in the past. And so be 38 people didn't have student debt or maybe 38 people never heard of it. So uh, maybe we should figure out um, how we can disseminate that form and make everybody more aware of it. Um, Cause I, I, you know, like we saw there, Bill's got people going into childcare, he's got people going into elder care. And so some of those employers might be um, eligible to, to offer that incentive, but if they don't know about it, they can't encourage. Mm. Good, thank you. Any some others? Parts of, some parts of uh, Ruby, um, WVU Medicine have the same if you're working for them for so long or you make a contract with them to work exclusively with them for X amount of time that they will uh, cover your schooling if you go to school there. So like you make so a, forward. right. So you go to HR one and you talk to them and say, hey, I want to work for you after I graduate school and do an internship there while I'm working or while I'm going to school. And I'll work for you for X amount of time if you'll pay for my schooling. So you Very don't have good. to pay for it up front. Okay. And so there's probably some penalties involved if you drop out or something, something occurs. Yes. And so I wonder how many other large employers are doing that in West Virginia. Um, and because, you know, people want, what do you hear? You know, why are you advancing in your career? Because training costs money. Because I'm currently employed. I don't have the time. I don't have the supports. And so if there are employers out there, um, we should be celebrating that they're doing that. And so we'll see, we'll see Ruby Hospital mentioned in our champions next month. Thank you for that, Glenda. The lineman program that Pierpont runs with First Energy set up the same way. So once a student's accepted into that program, First Energy pays for tuition, books, all that good stuff. The student agrees at the same time that, you know, I will basically hold up my end on the academic side, do what you need me to do. And when I graduate, I'm signing a five-year contract with you. Awesome. And I think that's what it is for WVU too. Yeah. And for medicine, I think it's a five-year contract. Good. And I think there's probably similar with like Bombardier uh, and, and folks that set up training programs because you hear them say, I need surveyors. I'm desperate for mm -hmm. And so how can we expand that and how can we open that pool up to individuals with disabilities and get their feet in the door to, to be, uh, you know, 
part of these programs. So that's awesome. So hopefully we can identify some additional employers uh, that we can shout from, because we're not, we're not afraid to shout out who's doing things right. We're also not afraid to shout out who, you know, where the gaps are and what we're doing wrong, because we're trying to, uh, we're trying to make policy change here. We're trying to find out what works and go that direction. So, you know, we want to celebrate our champions and uh, we want to figure out also where our gaps are with no hard feelings. So. Good. All right. We got Andy. Yeah. Oh, hey, Danielle. Yes. Um, I know this. I know this sounds a little bit crazy, but Taco Bell, I believe, offers a tuition reimbursement, help with financial aid and scholarship programs wow. in the company. Awesome. I and I think I've seen details. that. I've seen it on brochures and I've seen um, sheets. I was oh, just going to say sheets. Sheets mm -hmm. does it. And I mean, and food that's, service that's managers. Awesome. That I, yeah. Definitely. I had a manager come out and talk to us. It was for all employees, not just the management. Um, of, it was when it was very first starting. And he came out and was at the table just talking about how excited he was and that they hoped that more college kids would use Taco Bell to kind of be their gateway while they were going on to school. That's awesome. And you say that, Danielle, enterprise rent a car. Mm -hmm. They'll lift you up, oh, push you there through, we and wave <laughs> and send you on your way. So we're going to shout them out. Mm -hmm. Chick-fil-A is another um, company that does. Good. All right. We'll just keep celebrating who's doing things right. I love it. Does Chick-fil-A need to you to do something religious, though? <laughs> I wouldn't think so, if, as far as employment. No, no, it doesn't have to be religious. Okay. I think that's so some a, companies a that are like that are, so. Oh, no, Chick-fil-A doesn't, they don't have that in their, in their employment practices, so. Maybe you just, just the, have to pray. You just have to pray for the money. That's all. <laughs> Good one, Don. <laughs> well, you know, some right. places might need you to go to a certain school, like A and B or something like yeah, that. Yeah, then an eligibility requirement. Absolutely. Right. That, that's what I was referring to. Uh, okay. Number two. And what do we have? We've got five questions. So, good. all right. What do we know? Are employers offering competitive wages to students exiting college programs? Wages that are allowing them to live well, pay down their student debt, et cetera. And this is kind of an opinion piece, but what do you guys think? What is our group, how do you feel? We're going to college, was it worth it? We get out, can we find employment? Can we pay our bills? Can we pay our debt? I think it depends upon the occupation that you have. Depends on occupation, good, what else? It was my biggest concern about the REACH program was that it, you don't come out really with anything as far as a professional degree. And so, but you're still incurring, apparently, incurring the same tuition as everybody else. Yeah, um, and I was surprised by that. And Think College last month, um, they kind of focused on the opposite of that, the inclusivity on the certificate and the college credit program. And so I was a little surprised to hear that, um, but the right. competitive wages were great. I mean, we've got nobody making minimum wage. So, um, and I think that might just be um, the lay of the land. Um, and but minimum wage in Iowa is 7.25 an hour. Oh, um, I see. And, 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 and I, I don't wanna be critical of it. I'm just saying there, we have people incurring possibly a large debt and they are not allowed to get that through federal student loans. So they are incurring that debt in a private sector fashion, which may not even qualify them for, for forgiveness yeah. um, if they and go into certain. So, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's just that aspect of it was the concern to me because I, now I don't know enough about the country roads program. It sounded, like some in some aspects, the country roads program was similar to reach, but I don't know enough about it to know that exactly, you know, if folks obviously we don't have the as high college costs just from the start as a starting point. Um, but but uh, those are always my concerns about anybody going to college, be it people with disabilities or not, and what you're coming out with and what kind of debt you're going to incur when you ask the question, is it worth it, you know? Um, and I think of so many of the people with disabilities that we work with are not people that are going to get professional degrees. Um, 
even if they can go to college at some level, um, there's a certain percentage that will, but the majority aren't. And so how much debt is reasonable to take on if we can give them these internship types of experiences through our work-based learning services or through our other even CRP services, you know, we can kind of give them some of these similar experiences, um, life skills training and so forth. Now it's not as in depth and it's not as long. So they're not maybe as mature at the time uh, they're rolling out into the workforce as they would be if they spent two or three or four years in a program like REACH or Country Roads or whatever. Um, but still that aspect of it, I think we can give to them without them incurring any debt um, as far as that, that world experience, that internship, that employment experience. Um, and so for some individuals, I think they're better off going that route and then other individuals may be more fitting for, for a college setting or college type program like you talked about. Yeah, and Doug, I think that's really thoughtful. Uh, and you know, my background is special education and I used to get really upset uh, when everyone would just tell all of my kids, well, yeah, you're going to college next uh, because I saw those kids incurring debt um, and it was really frustrating for me as a special educator to know that life skills was what was needed and college was what was being promoted. And so I think it's a very delicate balance and I absolutely appreciate your point of view there. Um, and, and as far as it being similar, it is similar to the Country Roads program, um, whereas the four years, not so much. With Country Roads, it's two years and you're getting DOL recognized certificates throughout the two years. And then you either move in to a certificate program, such as like a hospitality certificate, or you go a credit, a college credit route, if that's what's appropriate for you. But we spend the first two years figuring out if that's appropriate for you. Um, and if not, then you're gonna get the skills you need and go and be employed. So that's one of the biggest differences between REACH and Country Roads is that, that four year general certificate. Uh, again, it's a lot of money and, and hopefully it's leading to that livable wage. But yeah, you've got to be a little skeptical. Healthy skepticism is good for all of us. I'm going to move us through the couple questions super fast uh, so that we can report back. So I'm going to close the rooms in about four to five minutes. So. Um, so real quick, I wanted to touch on what do we know that's out there for individuals with disability specific, uh, such as financial credits, incentives, um, anything workforce. like that. Mm. Workforce and DRS. Good, yeah, great. Mm. We'll celebrate our champions that already exist. We've got Workforce West Virginia and their training programs. Um, if you're not familiar with individualized, individualized training accounts, mm. those are ways that um, people can get their training or education paid for through approved service providers across the state. And we heard DRS, mm, of course, and we've got the uh, Pathways to Success mm, Toolkit online. Pathways to Success Toolkit. Any others that you know of? Financial credits, incentives, and then we're getting to resources. Oh, no, uh, past resources and supports. Okay. So policies, programs, resources, um, youth programs, um, which falls under workforce, but if you don't know about WIOA youth programs, so check them out. You can get your clients bonuses for completing programs, get them their boots and tools and tuition fees, books, all sorts of stuff covered. Um, the work opportunity tax credit, have you guys heard of that? or yes. WOTC. If you don't know about it, check it out. It's a really fantastic resource that I think is underutilized. Um, anything we know of in the past to entice employers. So along with WOTC, we also have bonding programs. There's many things you've heard of to support special populations. Uh, is there anything in the past that you miss that went unfunded, that we don't have anymore, that really worked? when it comes to talking to employers? Well, there was the old, I'll show my age here, it used to be called JTPA. Sure. Uh, and then it kind of became the Governor's Summer Youth Employment Program. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have either of those anymore. Basically, 
uh, employers got youth to work in jobs in their settings for free. Um, they were they paid the individual, but then they were totally reimbursed the, that person's wages. The old JTPA went up to six months doing that. Um, and, and almost are, everybody in the business, if you've been <clears> in it for a while, you've heard of JTPA. And there are still some youth programs, not typically specific to summer anymore, but if you haven't been in touch with your, your workforce youth programs or your on-the-job training, your incumbent, all those good stuff, they've got money. They've got money to pay wages, to pay training. Um, so yeah, it's changed a lot of names, but there is still we money. Um, right, we owe it took the, the place of JTPA. I mean, it, it subsumed all those responsibilities. DRS has a variety of services doing some similar things. Um, yeah. The old program though just used to be very simple um, for employers from their end of it. They just got a check and they didn't have to do much of anything. And the problem was, is it got abused because they would bring in groups, work them six months, let them go, bring in a new group for six months. Um, and they were so getting wasn't a really lot of training. free employment. Right. It was, it, they wanted people who could hit the ground running, you know, yeah. <laughs> they did. They didn't want, if a kid came in and needed much help, they, they were out the door. Whereas now with the DRS funds, I'm sure with workforce as well, it's like, any employer that does something like that, they're going to be quickly um, not utilized anymore. You know, so, so it's a, maybe an overtaxing. So, like, we're not making it easy enough for employers to participate from from their perspective. I, I think right. Oh, what absolutely. Happens, right. From what happens over time is you find the abuses of whatever system you create, then you start doing things to try to tackle those I'm abuses, saying. and then you end up making it so darn complicated. That nobody wants to do it anymore. <laughs> yeah. And, that's and I'll tell you, that's you know, the, the paperwork for contracts, it still looks tricky. And, you know, HR managers look at it and they're like, oh, I got to show this to my lawyers. Uh, when it comes down to it, you know, my experience with writing job contracts and working with people writing job contracts is they will do the work for the employer and they really want it to be as simple as let me deliver your check. Um, and so maybe that's gotten lost over the years. Um, right, right. I think that can be rekindled. I think we can bring that back. I know the. I think the work opportunity tax credit has suffered from that. Is why it's so underutilized. Is a lot of Probably. employers found it to be so complicated to, yeah. to reach the end point that they just said, "Ah, it's not worth the trouble." And in recent years, I always use it as an example. I had a young man, social security beneficiary, went to work at Pizza Hut on Elkins, and I watched. I watched the manager call the one eight hundred number and plug in the young man's social security number and see that he was eligible for Watsy. And and then I saw him hire more people with disabilities, like within the next two months, because he was like, "Oh, well, that wasn't that bad." So I think yeah. people just get nervous, or something went wrong at some point, like six years ago, and. Then or who it was or what the situation was, but they don't want to hassle with it. So we've got to kind of overcome that hurdle that we didn't necessarily create, but it's ours now. Uh, last question, I got to close the rooms. Oh, good, you guys are coming back. Uh, what was the main focus of the presentation that we want to encapsulate? Mine was, uh, we've got to change the community. Mm -hmm. Any others? I was really struck by the whole social aspect of their program and how in, important, and I, I agreed with it. To me, it made perfect sense that that's the, the social part of it is, is just as important as the academic side of it. And I totally agree with it. And I, was, I think it's a great part to have of the program. Full immersion. We're going to football games, we're going in the basement of the mountain lair, we're eating Chick-fil-A at the most trafficked location, all that good stuff. Yes. Very good. I'm going to close all the rooms. We got to wrap it up. Good sharing team. I appreciate you. Breakout rooms will close in 49 seconds and counting. Good. This hour and a half goes so much faster than I expect it to. You guys, would you be all right with three hour meetings? Just kidding. <laughs> I just have more to say. If you're gonna provide the popcorn, I'm all in <laughs> all three hour meeting. <laughs> Fair enough, if I send snacks, we'll stay longer. Yep, is that how it works in life? You know, when all, those, 
require tacos if we're doing three hours. Oh, <laughs> tacos. I'm for down for that. Fair enough. <laughs> hey, Manny used to live out west. She knows all about good tacos. I'll make you a good taco. You'll have to watch me cook, mm. cooking dinner while I do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. So we, I think we, we lost, we lost a good number of people and that's all right. I hope you guys had some good conversations. Um, I don't want to go over, so I want to wrap up real quick and I'm just going to ask each group to give me, um, let's see, one or two items. So Jen, your group talked about um, agencies, right? We did. Okay. And can you tell me, what did you guys, um, did you come up with programs that exist that are offering support services? Um, the only things that we came up with right now are rehab services and um, that right now this doesn't really have to do with college help, but there are some high schools that offer daycare for students. Oh, um, great. Yeah, so, child care is definitely one of those. Mm. Yeah, so we wanted to throw that in there that there are some high schools around the state that are offering daycare for students. Very nice. That can be a uh a deal maker for some people. Like we talked about the fears, like if you don't have what you need, uh, what is that thing that you need? And for a lot of people, that's childcare. Yeah, keeping them, Money keeping our high schoolers in school. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great one. And what did you guys pull from the main presentation that you really wanted to, to hold on to from Bill's presentation? Um, we said we wanted to learn more how to leverage those Medicaid dollars, I think was our biggest one. Yeah, um, I think probably everybody's feeling that That's way. what I was going to say. That's what we said too. That was everybody. I just wrote down what? Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. So Gina, that was your group's um, main point as well. And mine was uh, changing the communities. Cause I think, you know, it, it's, it's cheesy. You've probably all heard it. It takes a whole village. Uh, it might be cheesy, but it's absolutely true. And so that's why we're trying to expand our audience here to bring in more clients, more employees, uh, more employers and expanding that industry uh, because, you know, we have a common interest, but we need to get the employers and the other community stakeholders to have that same common interest with us. And we call that buy-in and we need it. So we have to find ways to make those conversations happen. And with that being said, I'm going to do a poll that I did last month and I'll ask you all to respond. Ooh. All right, I'm new to polls, bear with Mandy, me. Mandy, while you're doing that, I'm gonna drop in the chat a, uh, one thing real quick and then I'm gonna ask you to drop in the chat one thing, but I'm dropping in the chat the um, where to find information on Country Roads, which is West Virginia's very small beginnings of UI reach. Um, but we have applications um, if, you ha if you know somebody that would be interested in Country Roads um, for next semester, or next school year, we are accepting applications till April 1st. So I wanted to throw that in there. Thank you for saying so. And so your poll now is, again, we're trying to expand our audience. And I did get some responses from you guys. I really appreciated it. I, saw, I shot out some emails, inviting some people to the table. Who do you know that could come and have this conversation with us? Who needs to hear this conversation? Um, that you can bring to the table. And so think about who you know from other industries, your neighbor, your spouse, your brother, your mom, um, whoever. And would they want to come and talk to us uh, and join this conversation if you sent them the registration link, just to see if we were going to reach some additional industries? You know, it isn't an industry, but I think it goes in with what um, Maggie, Jason, and I talked about is like, you need to get the parents and the educators to buy in too. So maybe like some of those directors of special ed, parents, IEP coordinators, people over, people first, you, you know what I mean? Yes. Like, but, but, but it's, you know, because I was like, how do you get the, how I get the parents to buy in to be like, sure, you can go live on campus. You know, that's that is a good point. And, and I've seen a lot of Board of Education emails come through in the registration. And so that's good. We're getting those um, connections made and the parents. And, you know, we can talk to we're blue in the face to parents, but who do parents listen to? Other kids, other parents, other parents. Right. And so I think that's a huge um, piece to that. And the same for young people. I mean, we might get people all excited and talking about things, but it's when they're talking to their peers that you really start to see um, that, you know, that fire light on their people. And so we think we could add some government and some healthcare people to the conversation. And that's fantastic because, you know, in healthcare, 
Uh, of course, there's so many positions and you get your foot in the door and you can advance and have continuing education. Um, so that'd be great to have health to the table. And I know we know more than government and healthcare people in our We'll get there, folks. So we Speaking of government, we had a, a, a win yesterday. I don't know if anybody was on, you know, had their finger on the pulse of what was going on at the Capitol yesterday with the um, Disability Advocacy Day. Um, but I, I know that Employment First is a bill that uh, was passed th through the Senate and the House. So very exciting. And hopefully with that um, task force, you know, we can get more people educated about the needs that are there. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for saying so. And if you're not familiar with Employment First, check it out. It's in the headlines right now, so it shouldn't be hard to find it if you do a quick Google. Uh, you should know a ton of parents and, and kids that you might be able to get into this the D, with the DAC. Yeah. So yeah, tell, yeah. tell your clients. Um, yeah, I was excited to see you guys on the list because you know I don't have direct contact with clients so I depend on you guys and I know I heard from Jason he was gonna um, ask someone to join and so you know you guys have this direct contact so that's that's really valuable thanks for saying that Glenda so you know at your social agencies at SW resources you know at DAC at, um, invite people to join us you know I know you guys have um, employee councils and things like that so you've got folks that like coming to the table and like enforcing policy change so please invite those clients. Um, we, ha we have not had, our, our largest audience has been social agencies because this is this is our jam. This is what we're talking about. It's why we do what we do. Uh, but again, we are looking to expand that, bring state representatives, um, people that are making policy changes. And of course, the people that are our clients uh, that are out there. So yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for sharing that, Maggie. Um, okay, let's see what else. Gina, tell us something that you guys had the employee perspective. Um, so real quick, could you tell us um, how we think case managers and teachers could better prepare students for financial aid, for knowing about financial aid resources? How could we do that? We said to begin teaching the skills younger because a lot of times, you know, parents aren't aware this could be the first generation even talking, you know, about going to school. So begin younger and do it more frequently, you know, kind of, you know, just keep throwing it at them. Eventually some things will stick. Um, basically we, we do, we think it needs to be addressed more. And then I, we had said, make sure that these classes and the discussions are held when the students are actually in the classroom, right? And that sounds silly, but make sure they're not being pulled out for extended services. So hold the, hold the conversations when the kids are there. And then, uh, Jason had mentioned mirroring the services and I was not familiar with this at all, but an upward bound or trio programs that are at some colleges. Uh, what he said, West Virginia State, West Virginia Tech, Marshall, he thinks maybe WVU has one. Um, but again, and have peers talk to peers talk to the students because again, parents listen to parents, peers listen to peers. Mm -hmm. It's the truth. And I think the upward bound, is that where they're like getting some college experiences while they're still in school? Yeah, I mean, I, I was a counselor for four years when I was in college. One of my, ki one of my kids, he uh, had 20 credit hours before he graduated high school. Wow, talk about yeah, getting the upper hand. They would stay on campus for six weeks during the summer. The kids get a stipend for participating. Um, and a lot of these kids, well, the kids we had in, in at, at State, they were some poor kids, so that helped. They really and needed it. Get them clothes and shoes and food on the table. And then we got to take them on cool trips. We took them to New York and Chicago, Toronto, New Orleans. They went all nice. over the place. Oh, that sounds like a great program. And is that still a program that exists? Yeah, it's, it's um, I know it's an upper bound. Okay. I mean, it's at Western State now. And it's That's either great. trio or upper bound, depending on what grant they um, apply Where the for. funding is. Yes. And I mean, we talk about increasing college preparatory classes in the high school setting, but that's going above and beyond. And you've actually got the credits um, to do mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Upward Bound is actually a national program because I it know is. it sounds really in, familiar. Yeah, it's in several states that I know of. So that's why I was pretty sure that it was actually a national thing. Good. Let's keep that one in our back pocket. So I did. Yeah, the kid I was champion. talking about, he actually graduated college before I did, and I was his counselor. Nice. So well, yeah, when he starts off with 20 credits like that, I mean, that's the fast track. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that, Jason. 
Good. So I think we heard about some champions and I'll report next month on uh, some folks that are doing things right across the state. So I think we heard a lot of that and how we can expand that um, to the rest of the state. Mm -hmm. So I think I was a few minutes over last month. So I'm going to finish it up here right on time. I hope you guys will all come back in April. Uh, we're going to have is it Syracuse University uh, come and talk about a similar program. And then we're wrapping up transition on higher education. We're going to move into vocational education. Um, so new, exciting topic. Appreciate all you guys. Um, Jen, I didn't send that. Um, if you have a second, and I know I've kept you guys, kept you guys too long. We have a survey and now I've lost it. Like it's 4.58, you've got two minutes. You're good, minute and a half, minute, minute <laughs> 10 seconds, something like player. that. You're good, you're good. You're good. <laughs> I had it all ready here. I was all prepared. Yeah, too much stuff open and probably, or anything like me. Yeah, a little bit of that going on. <laughs> so I have the survey. And if you guys could fill out the survey before you head out today, I'm going to do the survey every month. And it's just the Qualtrics that we do at CED so we can track. And I should have done it when we still had more participants. But any responses are great. We track our efforts and who we reach. And you can make I hate to comments. tell you, Mandy, it's, but it's, it's not bound. It's not being Oh, found. did I do something wrong, Jen? I copied it. Yeah. I clicked on it when you sent it to me. Jen, can we just start our Qualtrics next month? We're just going to start it next month. I <laughs> on it this morning and I filled it out. So I don't know what I've done there. We sure can. I can just uh, adjust and it. You can e month. email it to us. Yeah, you can email it to us. Okay, I'll do oh, yeah. that. We and have the participants moment, we know. Yeah, and if not, we'll do it next month. I appreciate it. That's a great deal. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, See you next guys. time. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.